Can you hear me? Checking the mic, checking the mic. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> All right, so I'm gonna to talk to you today about coupling natural human systems at the decision-making scale. And I'm gonna do two things. I'm gonna talk about coupling models in the first half. And then in the second half, I'm gonna say why we're trying to uh, do this at the scale of the decision maker. And uh, the second half is really in collaboration with, with my student, Benjamin Minan, who's up at, here at the front. Uh, so I flew here on Monday from Southern Ontario, University of Waterloo, which is about 100 kilometers southwest of Toronto. And this landscape in Southern Ontario is incredibly human dominated. There's about 13 million people in that area. There's about 52,000 farms and competition for land is, is really intense. The housing market is really expensive and uh, there's a lot of drive to increase and, and sustain profitable farming for uh, small family farms in the area. And this isn't just true for Southern Ontario. This is also true around the Great Lakes and in particular around Lake Erie in Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, and the US. Now the basins around these, these lakes are, are shown in this slide here, but Lake Erie in particular shown in yellow has this basin which incorporates the majority of those farms in Southern Ontario. And the runoff from those farms is leading to massive eutrophication of Lake Erie. So we're getting massive algal blooms, which is creating a lot of toxicity. It's le um, leading to fish die off. The city of Toledo has had to shut down the pipes from extracting water from Lake Erie on multiple occasions. And part of my research program is to try and mitigate these issues, like many people in the room today. And so through that program, we're trying to quantify the impacts of best management practices. These are things that farmers are doing in their activities, to try and reduce the amount of runoff, the amount of nutrient flow to the hydrological system. And we're trying to identify critical locations for applications of these BMPs, learn how to better incentivize farm adoption of the BMPs to generate more sustainable land management practices. But of course, all this really requires decision maker buy-in, requires data, and of course, it requires models to prove that mitigation practices work. It's so like a good modeler, I went back to my modeling process and I thought, okay, we're gonna formalize what system we're working in, use a conceptual model to, to foster discussion, operationalize that in code, create a computational laboratory, work through some results and keep iterating, improving the, the system that we're working in. But what we see is we got two camps of work that are ongoing. We've got a group of people in the human systems, we've got a group of people in the natural systems. In some cases we get interaction between those groups or at least in terms of the modeling that's represented. Okay, so we'll have a lot of human system modelers that will do a really crude representation of the natural system, maybe using an inventory approach or benefits transfer approach where they'll say, we have, for example, land cover change, then we'll have uh, average value of carbon storage associated with that land cover change. So if we lose forest, then maybe we're losing, you know, temperate system, 9.8 kilograms of carbon per meter squared, something like that. So it's a really crude representation of what's happening. On the natural system, there's a lot of prescription going on. We're prescribing how human activities are changing that system, but there isn't this dynamic feedback between the systems and interaction that's happening. There's very few people that are doing that. And some of the separation is put in there partly because of the funding initiatives that are out there. Okay, so in Canada, we've got the Social Sciences and Human Humanities Research Council. They provide 388 million towards social sciences and 1.1 billion to the natural sciences. So social sciences is only getting about 26% of that funding. We're seeing similar outcomes in the US, and these are just numbers that I'm pulling off the internet, so don't hold me to them exactly. But uh, in the social sciences, we're getting about 250 million. And in the natural sciences, we're getting one and a half billion to math and physical sciences, 906 million to geosciences and engineering. And so the social sciences is really getting about 8% of that. Now there is those initiatives coupled natural human systems, which are coming out, and they're about 18 million this year in funding, but that's only gonna fund six projects, maybe seven, okay? So this, there's this embedded uh, disparity between social sciences and natural sciences. And then there's this focus on these different funding agencies, which are kind of uh, keeping us uh, separated. And so one of the ways that we can, we can start to harness this is that we've got specialists in the human systems, specialists in the natural systems. And instead of having these um, crude representations of interaction between them, we can harness those uh, specialists and their work through coupling models together. When I talk about model coupling, what I mean is a coordinated communication between models. Okay. And so this figure on the right is showing uh, on the x-axis the frequency of communication and the degree of coordination on the y-axis. 
And the majority of this coupling that's taking place is in the center row, which is obviously hard to see from the back of the room, but it's a unidirectional flow from one model to another, kind of like our prescription that's happening in the natural sciences typically. Okay. And this is true for most of us in many cases. This is my research. I do this all the time. Um, here I've got a human dominated landscape in Ohio with uh, forest cover and ecosystem models that want to represent ecosystem function like carbon storage are point based. We multiply, uh, it represents the vertical system very well. We uh, will we'll run those models and then we'll mul uh, multiply them out against the area that those models represent, kind of like in a hydrological uh, model, we'd use the HRU and uh, apply that to the landscape to estimate evapotranspiration, carbon storage, runoff, those sorts of things. But we know that's not the case. We've got patterns that affect how ecosystems behave. And in this case, uh, I measured air temperature treatments and humidity from the edge of the forest to the interior and reparameterized the models along different swaths of edge effects to show that we get massive amounts of carbon storage differentials depending on the size and shape of the patches. And we can transfer this to the human system as well. So here's some work that we did where we were coupling an agent-based model to a biome BGC ecosystem process model to investigate how land management practices on residential landscapes affected carbon storage when we were adding uh, to the landscape through irrigation and fertilization or removing coarse woody degree, grass clippings, and those sorts of things. And these are giving us massively different carbon trajectories. So many of us are doing these types of unidirectional impacts, but what we want to get to is the upper right where we're having bidirectional interaction between our models and feedbacks between our models. And this inclusion of the feedbacks and how we represent them really increases the nonlinearity and the variability in our results and gets us closer to understanding and getting insights about the systems that we're actually interested in. And so this was the focus of a CSDMS workshop back in 2016, where there was about 30 of us here that uh, were working in this area putting our minds together and, and sharing our experiences. We published this paper in Earth System Dynamics last year, making comparisons about the different types and styles of coupling that we did in our, in our research programs, along with um, how the feedbacks were represented in those different initiatives. And then we also identified a number of lessons that we learned as a community. The first lesson was about <clears throat> remembering modeling as an iterative process. And so I highlighted that already, but in, in this case, when we're starting to couple models together that haven't been coupled before, there's data that we haven't typically collected. And so one example is that when we com combined the agent-based model with Biome BGC in the residential landscape, we realized that residential landscapes are really void of any data about carbon storage in the soil and the vegetation on those properties. So that fostered new uh, proposals and new papers that were exploring and quantifying carbon storage in residential landscapes that we're now bringing back into the modeling process. Part of that is also leveraging the sensitivity analysis of our models. Because when we couple them together, we don't always know what parameters or variables are gonna be really important, what processes are really gonna affect the feedbacks and interactions. So we need to use sensitivity analysis to identify those pieces to foster where those additional research efforts are gonna go. We also noted creating a common language, as you've all heard the standard names convention that CSDMS is putting forward that's incredibly important, not just for communicating between human and natural scientists, get on the same conceptual page, but it also feeds into the next one in terms of making code open access. If we can interpret that code easier because we have the standard naming convention, it's gonna help us out a lot more in making progress. Making the code open access here is about um, making sure that we provide hooks and leverage points between our systems. So for example, in ecosystem models, there's often mass balance equations that are provided, but those are just inherent in the natural system. They don't provide hooks and leverage points for us to add fertilization and manipulate some of the nutrient cycling activities that are going on in there. Um, and so if we do that, then we can foster the greater collaboration between natural and human scientists. Ensuring consistency is about um, making sure that when we have models that may represent similar processes, that we understand how those processes are similar or different from each other. So if we have a natural uh, system model that has a, uh, something to do with wood harvest and we have a human system that has something to do with wood harvest, are those actually teaming up with each other? Do they mean the same thing? We have to come to some sort of resolution as to which one we're gonna move forward with when we couple those models together. And then of course, we're always dealing with different spatial and temporal issues when we're trying to combine models together. So we have to reconcile those. So here's a, a picture of some figures from some work by Tom Evans back in 2013 that was looking at coupling uh, carbon and land use models 
with natural systems models on the left, human system models on the right, uh, temporal scales on the bottom and, and spatial scales on the, on the y-axis that demonstrate that the natural system models are typically acting at a finer temporal resolution and a coarser spatial resolution than the human system models. The human system models are often starting at an annual time step. And they're often acting at a one kilometer to a hundred kilometer kind of meso range of activity that's taking place. And <clears throat> reconciling this is, is a necessary issue in order to move forward. But what I think we're missing is an opportunity here, which is to scale the decision maker. We're making decisions subannually. Farmers are making decisions subannually. When you're mowing your lawn, clipping your trees, our interactions with the environment are subannually. And so I think there's an opportunity for us to better represent the relationship between humans and the natural system at that decision making scale. So part of my research program is about moving forward with that representation through the combination of drones, field work, and simulation models. And so I constructed a conceptual model, an agent-based model of agricultural land management systems, um, where we have individual actors in the real world, agents represented as virtual actors in the model. Um, and we want to represent hundreds to thousands of these across the landscape in Southern Ontario. So don't worry about the, the specifics in this diagram, but that's just basically the human model. And most of the times, the way people inform these human models are through social survey. So we've been conducting social surveys over the last year and a half, um, where we're trying to use those data to empirically inform the characteristics of the agents, the behaviors of the agents, how they interact and decide when to adopt or stop using BMPs, those sorts of things. And what we're trying to bring to it is the addition of drones to validate and calibrate natural process models at the scale of the decision making. Okay, why drones? Because farmers love drones. They get all excited about new technology. It opens up that kind of communication portal for me um, with them when I don't have a relationship with them in the past. Students love drones. They want to get jobs and they think this is going to be a new way forward. Plus, it's kind of exciting to be flying drones. And of course, little kids love drones, right? Um, and so what we want to do is go out on demand with the drone, collect really high resolution data and see how that's going to um, work with our natural system models at that scale of the decision maker. But before we do that, we have to lend some credibility to it and determine how that drone performance and accuracy is going to measure up. So as a little aside, I'm going to mention that we went out and looked at uh, profiling stream banks with a terrestrial laser scanner uh, and compared that to drone and manual measurements to validate that the drone was actually going to provide us highly accurate data for representing natural system processes. So here we are on one side of the stream um, doing the TLS scanning on the other side of the stream um, with some Leica equipment. Then in Ontario, the government uses what's called the Ontario Stream Assessment Protocol to go and measure transects across the province and different streams that they're interested in measuring. So we, we also went out and conducted that um, with, here's my student, Omar Jinich. And then I was flying uh, a UAV doing um, imagery collection that we're using in Structure for Motion. And so we put all this together in uh, the generation of point clouds from the TLS and the UAV. And this is showing the vegetation on the stream banks, which we then have to filter out to create the terrain. And then we can make some comparisons between our manual measurements, the TLS, and the UAV. And so what we identified was that the manual measurements were having highly systematic underrepresenting in terms of the slope of the bank, the height of the bank. And so we were having challenges in using those data moving forward for calibrating uh, the models. Um, so we, we can measure change detection in the stream of about 66 centimeters, which is quite coarse. Our UAV performed incredibly well relative to the TLS. So we're getting average errors of four centimeters with a 95% confidence interval. We can detect change at 14 centimeters and throwing in a host of different um, site conditions and some statistical models. What we really identified as the limiting issue is the accuracy of the ground control point locations. So in this histogram on the bottom left, these are where we have poorly located ground control points. We're getting errors in the you know, 30 to 40 centimeter range. Um, and if we have highly accurate uh, ground control point locations then we're getting accuracy below uh, five centimeters. So we kind of proved to ourselves, okay, we can do this. We can use UAVs. We're um, competing well with the industry standard for uh, 3D surface reconstruction, which is coming from the terrestrial laser scanning. And so now we can start to use these data to collect them and start to validate and calibrate 
um, in-stream erosion models in this case or other types of natural system models in our other research. And with the drone, we can cover such an extensive amount of area at such a high resolution that we can start to map large spatial extents, these corridors across the province, and start to establish relationships between land management activities and in-stream erosion processes. So there's a bunch of um, stream monitoring and research teams in Ontario that are really excited about this opportunity to go beyond transects to actual spatial coverage of the stream network. So take that back to the conceptual model that I mentioned, this agent-based modeling framework. And what we want to do is we want to minimize the impact on farmers. So we want to go out and we want to do a rapid agricultural assessment where we throw a few drones up in the sky, collect as much data as possible, conduct a social survey, get out of there in four hours or a day, and then go back and start to parameterize our models. On the side, we're also doing lots of um, some uh, kind of combinatorial work to decide when and how to collect these data, different flight patterns, timing of the year, and that sort of thing. So um, I wanted to show a picture of Ben because he's been instrumental in this. You can see him clearly in the center with the TLS scanner right there, measuring an erosion plume down here. Um, the specifics of his work are in the poster, uh, strategically located by the coffee machine. Um, and, and so he's out there doing the TLS scanning, I'm doing the flying, and we've got a, a huge situation of ground control points in the landscape to reconstruct this surface. So we've got a 40 acre uh, field that's located on the Nith River. The Nith River is one of the, the strongest contributors of nutrient uh, flow to the Grand River, which then goes into uh, Lake Erie and leads us back to our eutrophication problem. And so it just blows my mind every time I look at this picture and I visit the field is the volume of erosion that's happening on this one farm field. This is 40 acres. And the, before we got there, the farmer had just instituted four berms on the landscape to slow down that water flow, collect the, um, kind of create some deposition points. And it's been a huge amount of deposition that takes place. So it's a little bit hard to see back there, but there's massive deposition. These are some of the, um, uh, cones funneling the, the water into the ground, into their um, tile drainage system. And when we initially went out, they were about five and a half feet. They are about three feet or two feet in some places. And um, he's gone out with hundreds of bucket loads with a front end loader to redistribute that soil back uphill in the landscape prior to tilling that field. And so I know this is a lot. I'm trying to figure out how much is this to picture. And I just had my third baby and we bought a minivan. And I didn't know I would love minivans as much as I do. I should have had a minivan in college. Uh, I'm, not, I'm literally not joking. It's, I love minivans. Um, so I thought, and the reason why I love them is because I can pack so much in them and it's not stressful to then pack the car and make everybody happy. So I've got all this space and I started thinking, how much soil could I fit in that minivan? And so Ben's measurement is that with a TLS, we're getting 26 meters cubed just from this one plume of four ma massive plumes on this one field. That's almost five minivans full of soil. All right, and the UAV data uh, just for that location is, is matching up pretty well. You know, we'd, we'd prefer better, but it's, it's doing pretty well there. Um, and so part of that uh, process, when we want to start moving this towards the modeling, the hydrological and erosion models, is that they all involve some level of flow accumulation. All right, so on the left, we have a 10 meter DEM that is, is distributed across the province. Um, and here's what the flow accumulation pathways look with that DEM. And on the right hand side, we've got the five centimeter DEM that we created from our drone data. And the first thing that you'll notice is that we get these um, kind of horizontal transfers of, of flow accumulation, which is happening because of the tillage practices, the contour tilling that this farmer's doing. And the difference between the left and the right side is the difference between interacting with the farmer and the farmer ignoring you. If we take data out from what's shown in, in, uh, on the left-hand side here, it's not gonna agree with any of their experiences. They're gonna think, why are we telling them what to do or how to do it or have any interaction with them at all? What they see is what's happening on the right-hand side. They know where erosion's happening. They know that they're encountering erosion, but this enables us to start to interact with them and do a better representation of how their management activities are actually influencing the natural process. And this gets really exciting when we start to link these with agent-based models of water packets moving on the landscape. So we can actually model packets of water, drop them on the landscape, see where they start, where they end up, 
and we can start to see where nutrients originate or pollutants originate and, and reside afterwards. So we've been using, um, this is just uh, in the region of Waterloo, we've developed a, a simple model with manning coefficients, land cover, and some other variables in there to see how the water is moving through the landscape and comparing that against hurricane hazel data, um, which is matching up really nicely. So that's the direction we wanna go. We wanna start dropping these on the farm field and see where those nutrients are moving and how is that gonna to relate to um, different fertilization applications. We're also using these data to calibrate and validate crop models. So we're working with DSAT crop system EPIC. Um, this is with my student, Omar Jinich. And we're comparing the crop yields that we're generating with those models to the combine data, which is shown in the center on the right, with the drone data that we're collecting in terms of NDVI, LAI, plant heights, and those sorts of things. When we go out to the field, we want to maximize our impact in terms of data collection. So we also want to look at things like pollination services that are happening around the periphery of the farm. So we've got another project where we're looking at um, mapping individual plants where we focused on milkweed. And, uh, and we can do that. It's amazing. At a half a centimeter resolution, we can actually identify individual plants um, and start to look at how uh, the management activities are influencing those pollination services in proximity to those fields that are cultivated. And so where does this take us? The farmers know what's in their field, right? They don't really want us to tell them what to do or how to do it. And so if we come in uh, abrasively like that, it's gonna be a problem. What we wanna do is maybe highlight what they already know in a different way. So we wanna show them that, yeah, we know that you know where the erosion is happening, but maybe you don't understand how much erosion is actually happening. How is this affecting your bottom line now and into the future? And then we can start to work with them to come up with alternative approaches to mitigate the issues and increase their decision-making capacity to respond to natural processes. And the most fun part about this is, as many of you know, is interacting with the farmers, transferring that knowledge back and forth with them. And now we're like a sounding board. They come to us with questions all the time about what we can and can't do with drones and with natural models. And so what I'd argue is that if we can't <clears throat> demonstrate the environmental impacts of human activities at the scale of the decision-maker, then changing, influencing, and adapting human behavior is gonna be much more difficult for us. And if we can't calibrate and validate our natural system models at the scale of the decision maker, then the relevance of our models and our science to society is going to be diminished. And our ability to complete this representation of coupling and feedbacks between human and natural systems is gonna be diminished. And there, we're gonna have less uh, ability to change this complex system where we've got heterogeneous actors uh, making decisions independently and in coordination with their neighbors and their networks in a heterogeneous landscape that are having cumulative impacts to affect regional issues like eutrophication of Lake Erie. This leaves us with all kinds of different questions, like what is the accuracy of our natural process models when we're applying them at that scale? Um, how do land management activities affect uh, these uh, natural processes locally and cumulatively across the region? And are there thresholds that we can identify that trigger changes in behavior so we can start to nudge them in advance before we have uh, issues. And so I invite you all to come, maybe not everybody, but most people <laughs> to the breakout session in 3.3 tomorrow to talk about coupled modeling of human natural systems. What are our goals? How are we gonna move this forward as a team? And what we really need is to identify what are your needs as natural system modelers? What do you wanna get from the, natural, from the human system group to help uh, better create those linkages? Of course, this couldn't be done without the funding help of, of different agencies and my student team, including you know, Ben and his poster in the back for more details. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Um, I love the word decisioneers. I had not seen that before, and I think it's such a cool way of thinking about uh, the whole process of decision making and uh, how to interact with decision makers. Um, we have time for some questions. So if people are having questions, Alison is <laughs> very quick. We make it very clear that we will not have any location identification information uh, available. Um, and the social surveys are all anonymous. We don't have any relationship with their information and their location in there as well. Um, so far, we've been lucky through our networks to be working with farmers that are interested in working with us. 
Um, uh, although Ben has had some experiences going to some farms and being um, chased off the land, uh, but um, but so far so good. Good question, Nicole. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I do not remember ever using the word fire. Oh, so berms, sorry. Can, if I say sorry and processes, can I blame it on my accent? <laughs> it, this was an easy one. <laughs> yeah, I've got that question. They're putting, uh, they're, they're putting soil berms and planting them with grass to stop the flow of water downhill. And so the water collects their pools and goes down a drainage pipe into the, the drainage tile system. Thank you. Is there one, one last question in the back? We haven't right now. We've just been using a questionnaire and just kind of what we learned from interacting with them. We've kind of approached it more, even though I, I'd say I'm, I'm more on the human side because I've been building agent based models for 20 years and, and this natural system stuff is a little new to me in the last decade, let's say. Um, uh, we were kind of approaching it more from where are the locations that we want to collect this natural system data from with the drone and with the TLS. And then we're kind of hitting up farmers in those areas to work with. And in most cases, they've been really, really receptive to it. And part of that is because we have the drone technology and they get excited to see what's going on. Some of them have even had um, DJI Phantom 4s and they want to compare theirs to ours and learn about the differences and, and that sort of thing, which has been fun as well and, and surprising. That's a great question. We uh, actually started in Europe. I post doctored with uh, Mark Roundsville and uh, University of Edinburgh. And we had several sites that we were modeling agricultural decision-making in Europe. And so I took that when I came to the University of Waterloo and kind of modified it for Southern Ontario. And then we actually went through a third modification to really focus on BMP adoption as well. So I have a, a bunch of links to um, four surveys that were conducted in different countries in Europe um, as part of the kind of original processes for developing that to make a comparative analysis down the road. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, guys.